uh, this morning. It's quite a long one, so we're going to do things slightly differently uh, this morning. The way it's going to work is Josie is going to come and read a bit of the account we're looking at today, and then we'll have part of the sermon, and then Josie will come and read the next bit, and so on and so on and so on. But before Josie comes to read the first bit that we're looking at uh, today, let me reintroduce you to the family that we encounter in it. Uh, this family is a family where each parent has a favourite son. And in this family, the, the members of it, they, they don't speak to one another, but talk behind one another's backs. They disown one another. They deceive one another. They deliberately exploit one another's weaknesses. Uh, they, they plot and they scheme behind closed doors. While those who are being schemed against eavesdrop in to hear what's going on. At the family we meet in our reading from Genesis this morning is a deeply dysfunctional family. But their story is not here to, to make us feel better uh, about ourselves and about our families as we think, well, phew, at least we're not like that. We may be bad, but it could be a lot worse. It's not here to do that. And, and neither is it here to entertain us like some car crash reality TV uh, where we make a sport of looking on at someone, else, someone else's uh, misfortune. No, rather, this account is here to hold up a mirror to us, to help us look into our own lives and to see where actually there's dysfunction in us and to bring those dark deeds out into the light. And the main thing we're going to see in the mirror this week is that sin doesn't pay. Sin doesn't pay. If we try and oppose God, it'll make us unhappy uh, and we won't win, so to speak. Uh, we're going to look at the four members of this family. We're going to look at uh, Esau, who wants God's blessing without living God's way. Uh, we're going to look at dad, Isaac, who's led by what he longs for uh, instead of the Lord. Uh, we're going to look at mum, Rebecca, who pursues the right things, which is great, but she does it in the wrong way, which is not good. And then uh, second son, Jacob. Jacob, he worries about being caught uh, rather than about the sin that might lead to him being caught. And as we look at each of those four family members, it will become crystal clear that sin doesn't pay, that opposing God makes you unhappy, uh, that we can't win. Uh, as it were. So before uh, we have a look, before we see that, let me lead us uh, in a prayer, asking that God might give us eyes to see uh, ourselves looking uh, back at us from this reading. Our Father, as we come to a difficult part of your word this morning, as the Bible holds up a mirror to our lives and, and we might see things in these characters that are in ourselves that we don't particularly like. We pray, please, that you would give us the humility to, to see that uh, and, and to own that, but that we wouldn't wallow in it, um, but that we would bring it to you, that we would admit it, confess it to you. And so enjoy the, the forgiveness and the restoration and the transformation uh, that you hold out to us. So we pray you might give us eyes to see ourselves, but also uh, give us hearts that, that long for and appreciate uh, the forgiveness you offer. And we pray that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Josie, come and read our first bit for us. Twenty-eight, um, Genesis 26, starting at 34. Jacob takes Esau's blessing. When Esau was 40 years old, he married, he married Judith, daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for his elder son Esau and said to him, 
my son. Here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Thanks, Jesse. As we've seen, Esau is the first one to step uh, onto the stage. And as I said a moment ago, Esau is someone who wants God's blessing without living God's way. And he wastes no time in going about that. Did you see in the very first verse that Josie read for us, uh, we have Esau marrying two people. That's not a good start, is it? Uh, Judith, daughter of Berai the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. Uh, he marries these two women, women not from his own clan, but from the Hittite clan. And, and that's a problem because uh, God had promised to bless the world through Esau's clan, Esau's family, not the Hittite clan. And so as uh, Esau marries these two women, uh, he, he's sort of stepping out of God's plan. Uh, he's choosing not to live God's way. Uh, and he makes that mistake not once, but twice. And, and no doubt because of the, the fundamental differences in the way of looking at the world between uh, that his family have and the Hittite families have. These wives, verse 35, were a source of grief to his parents, to Isaac and Rebecca. Not a great start, but then things get even worse as Esau's father, Isaac, steps on to the stage. Uh, Isaac, verse 1 of chapter 27, he, he's getting old. He knows he doesn't have long to live anymore. And so he calls his favorite son, Esau, into his room. And he says, Esau, it's time for me to pass on God's blessing to you. However, however, Esau knows as well as Isaac does that God has said that this blessing is not going to go to Esau. It's meant to go to his twin brother, Jacob. That's the line through which God is going to continue to bless his people and through whom he's going to bless the nations. And Isaac knows that and Esau knows that, but he doesn't correct his dad when dad says, hey, come in, let me bless you. He doesn't even say, dad, are you sure we should do things this way? It's all a bit cloak and dagger, isn't it? Why don't we, we gather the family together? Why don't we just talk about this like grown-ups? No, there's none of that because he's happy to go along with his dad's plan. Because he wants God's blessing without living God's way. And that, uh, perhaps needlessly to say, is, is what we do when we choose to follow in Esau's footsteps. If we do what he does, if we uh, choose to marry people outside of God's people as God's people, as much as we might hope for blessing in that. Uh, the Bible's testimony and the lived experience of uh, many dear Christian brothers and sisters, friends of mine, is that we're setting ourselves up for grief and hardship and heartache. Or, or when maybe we do something slightly different, and, and as Esau does with his father's godless plan, we go along with a, a godless plan, hoping things will work out okay in the end. Well, as we see, it'll end badly, as it always does. We want God's blessing without living God's way. Our sin, it doesn't pay, doesn't pay. That's Esau. Of course, we've also seen Isaac in these opening verses. And as I said, Isaac is someone who is led by what he longs for rather than being led by the Lord. And we see this not only in how determined he is to pass on the blessing of God to his son Esau, not his son Jacob, as God would prefer. Uh, but in what he asks for in verse 3, have a look down there with me, 
uh, Isaac says to Esau, uh, now then, get your equipment, your quiver and your bow and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I might give you my, uh, my blessing before I die. Uh, Esau, as we've seen over the past couple of weeks, he's a, he's a man's man, the rugged hunter of the family, and there's nothing that his dad likes more than Esau's game, casserole. And so Isaac says, Esau, my son, make me dinner and I'll give you the blessing. Uh, or perhaps a bit more crassly, Esau, I want a good meal before I die. If you get it for me, I'll give you God's blessing. I don't care uh, what God says. Because Isaac, he, he's led by what he longs for rather than being led by the Lord. And of course, that's something we can fall into as well, isn't it? Uh, it's what happens when we give in to our desires, uh, whether it's being overindulgent in what we eat, like Isaac, or maybe it's giving in to our temper and lashing out in anger, or, or splashing our cash on the things that we can't afford. That when we do things like that, like Isaac, we're being led by what we long for uh, rather than being led by the Lord. And when we do that, as Isaac will discover, so we too will discover that sin doesn't pay. Not a great start, is it? That Isaac and Esau, they haven't covered themselves in glory. Uh, we're going to read on and see if Rebecca and Jacob can do any better. Joseph's got our next bit of our reading for us. Um, 27 verse 5. Now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man, while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me and just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of her elder son Esau, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his necks with a goat skin. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father. Thanks, JC. You probably noticed it got no better when Rebecca and Jacob appeared. Uh, because un unbeknown to Isaac and Esau, Rebecca is listening in as they scheme. And so she knows second half of verse. Uh, hang on, that's not verse seven. Oh, yeah, no, she knows what, um, uh, sorry, what Isaac says, second half of verse seven. He knows that she knows that he wants to give the blessing to Esau in the presence of the Lord before he dies. Uh, but of course, Rebecca knows because God has told her that that blessing belongs to Jacob and not to Esau. Uh, she knows what is right. And maybe if we're going to be fair to her, well, she wants what is right. It's just that she goes about it in entirely the wrong way. 
Because rather than trusting God and waiting for him to fulfill his promises, she takes matters in to her own hand. Uh, we saw, didn't she? She says to Jacob, listen, my son. Your dad's eyesight is shot. So if we dress you up as your brother and I whip up some goat stew, uh, you can get in before Esau and get the blessing instead. Uh, Jacob's got a concern, a, a question, but mum, what about, and yet that doesn't prick her conscience at all. She plows on, end of verse 13. Just do what I say. Go and get them the goats for me and I'll make the stew and we'll do the plan. Rebecca, she wants the right thing, but she pursues it in completely the wrong way. And again, we can be tempted to do that, can't we? And maybe we, um, we downplay some of the difficult things that Jesus has to say in our culture to get a friend along to church. Or, or maybe we, we take a shortcut at work to hit that target. Maybe we, we try and encourage someone by saying, oh, yeah, I'll definitely pray for you. Without actually ever doing any praying. We can pursue the right thing. Uh, getting people to church, doing our work well, encouraging others in entirely the wrong way. What Rebecca does, right thing, wrong way. Whereas Jacob, well, Jacob is much more worried about being caught than about doing something wrong. You see, when he hears his mum's plan, he, he's not worried about its morality. He's worried about its feasibility. Have a look, verse 11. Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, oh, but my, my, my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. We hear Jacob saying that and we think, Jacob, let's get one thing straight. Uh, if you did that, it wouldn't be that you're appearing to trick your dad. It would be that you definitely are tricking him. Let's be honest about that, shall we? But that's Jacob all over. He worries about being caught uh, rather than about doing wrong, rather than about sin. And again, we can do that oh so easily, can't we? It's, it's what we do when we're, we're happy to lie about something as long as we get what we want as long as no one finds out that's okay isn't it a little white lie here or there or maybe it's what we do when uh, we talk about someone behind their back maybe we pick the other person in the office we know that they get on with and so we know that they're not gonna find out or maybe it's uh what we do when we happily have one too many drinks with our work colleagues because we know that none of our Christian friends are going to see and so call us uh, out on it. When we do things like that, we're, we're worrying about being caught, about being seen rather than about sin. Okay, our sorry story is not over. Uh, Joseph is just going to come and read the next bit for us. Verse 18, he went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? he asked. I am, he replied. 
Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he bought some wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. He takes the stew into his father. Jacob's main concern is still not being found out. Did you notice first he lies to cover his tracks? Verse 18, he went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son. He answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Then verse 20, Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? Oh, the Lord your God gave me success. First lies, then blasphemy. He's got no problem with sinning as long as he can get away with it. Isaac, he's still not quite sure about this son. The, the voice, it just doesn't sound right. And so he asks again, verse uh, 24, Are you really my son Esau? I am. He, Jacob, replies. There are so many points at which Jacob could have put his hand up. He could have repented. He could have said, oh, do you know what, Dad? Actually, it's, it's me. It's Jacob. Look, I'm sorry. I've got myself in a real mess. Can we have a grown-up conversation about this, please? And yet he doesn't. Why is that? Well, this is Jacob. He worries about being caught rather than about doing wrong, about sin. And again, we can so easily fall uh, into this. Maybe, um, maybe someone challenges us on how we speak to uh, someone else, but, but we sort of try and cover our tracks. Maybe we pull some biblical uh, language out. Oh, no, I wasn't being harsh to them. I was just speaking the truth in love. And sometimes you have to say hard things to people. Now, that might be true, but in my experience, when we, when we want to say something like that, we're more worried about being caught than about doing wrong. Or maybe you've experienced something like Jacob experienced here. God gives us so many opportunities to repent, but we sort of back away from those chances and we don't want to take them because actually all that we care about is being caught uh, rather than the wrong that might lead to us uh, being caught. We find it all too easy to be just like Jacob. Tragically, though, it's not just Jacob who comes off badly in this section as well. Because once again, we see Isaac being led by what he longs for rather than being led by the Lord. You'd think he'd join the dots, uh, wouldn't you? You think Isaac would have realized that something was up because, well, first, he's surprised by how quickly the food comes. And then he's confused because he hears Jacob's voice and not Esau's. And then he tastes, not the casserole, the game casserole he loves so much, but Rebecca's goat stew. And yet none of those things make him stop because he's so determined to bless Esau and he's so desperate for some good food and good wine. 
So after the meal, verse 27, he went to him and kissed him. And when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, of course, they're Esau's best clothes, aren't they? He blessed him and said, ah, oh, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. There's a compliment I think only one man could give to another. It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Um, anyway, uh, what's the blessing like? This blessing, verse 28, it's a blessing of prosperity. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches and abundance of grain and new wine. And it's a, a blessing of dominion, verse 29. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. As Isaac blesses the son who he thinks is Esau, he, he holds nothing back. Nothing is kept in reserve for the son he thinks is Jacob. And he does that knowing that, well, Jacob is the son that God says will be blessed. He's the one whom God has chosen. And yet in this blessing, we see Isaac being led by what he longs for, uh, that the blessing might fall on Esau uh, rather than by the Lord. And isn't that something we can do too? We can so easily uh, suppress our consciences when they're telling us not to do something. And yet we, we sort of put our conscience in a box because we want to give in to the temptation that the conscience is warning us against. What Esau, uh, sorry, Isaac has experienced here. And when we do that, pressing our conscience, giving in to our temptation, we're being led by what we long for and rather than by the Lord. Let's keep going. Josie, next bit, please. Thank you. Verse 30. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came and deceitfully and took your blessings. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessings. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessings for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you and I have made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept out loud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Did you feel the anguish of Isaac and Esau as they realised their plan had failed? Isaac, verse 
uh, 33. He trembles violently. Why? Well, because blessings, they're a bit like an email. Once you've uh, clicked send, uh, there's nothing you can do to get them back, no matter how much you may want to. And he's given everything to Jacob. He's got nothing left to give to his beloved son, Esau. And so his blessing for Esau, it, it's not a blessing, it's, it's a curse. Verse 39, top of page 30. Your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. He won't know prosperity, he'll know poverty. Verse 40, you will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw off his yoke from your neck. He'll know servitude and strife. Not a blessing, is it? It's a curse. And so it's no surprise, just back a few verses in verse 34, that, that Esau's in shock. That he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, bless me too, father. And yet even in this moment, even when Esau is desperate for God's blessing, do you know what? He still doesn't have any interest in living God's way. Um, have a look at verse uh, 36, where Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? Uh, his name means sort of grasping. Because he said, this is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. And the problem with this, if you were, at, uh, as you would know, if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, is that this isn't true. Uh, what Esau has just said here is uh, a lie. Uh, Jacob didn't take his birthright. Esau sold it to him for a bowl of lentil stew. And yet Esau, he, he doesn't own his mistake. Rather, he, he, he rails against it and he comes up with a plan to get the blessing for himself. Verse uh, 41, back over the page, page 30. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the day of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. He is thinking, if I knock off my brother, the blessing, it falls to me. Things have gone badly wrong for Esau, hasn't he? He's lost all sense of perspective. He's so desperate to get this blessing. He's planning to kill his twin brother. He's so desperate for God's blessing and yet entirely disinterested in living God's way. And when we too, when we fail to own our mistakes and our sin, sins and our shortcomings and we, we lash out and we blame everyone else except ourselves and we come up with increasingly desperate plans to try and secure God's blessing, well, tragically, we're walking in Esau's footsteps. And we're going to see what comes of his uh, tragic plan uh, in the final part of our reading. Verse 42. When Rebecca was told what her elder son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in, in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose, lose both of you in one day? Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of this hit, these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, 
my life will no longer be worth living. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethel. Take a wife for yourself there, from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful, increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessings given to Abraham, so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac said Jacob on his way, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethel, the Arameum, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. And when he blessed him, he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. So he went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sister of Nebi Nebioth, and daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. Thanks, Josie. Great job. Esau is plotting. And surprise, surprise, there's Rebecca with her ear at the door. And surprise, surprise, she has a plan. And she finally speaks to her husband. The first time Rebecca has spoken to Isaac in this whole section. And she says, verse 46, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, oh, my life will not be worth living. Uh, Rebecca says to Isaac, um, why don't we let Jacob go and marry someone from our own clan? And at first, it sounds like at last, someone is finally doing the right thing in this sorry tale but actually we know it's just part of Rebecca's ruse to get Jacob away from his vengeful brother and even in the reason that she uh, gave for Jacob marrying from within their clan uh, she's more concerned with her own interests than in God's interest did you see oh it would make my life a misery if both my sons married Hittite women's you see, this time, she, she wants the right things, but for all the wrong reasons. Perhaps uh, surprisingly, Isaac agrees with Rebecca, and so he summons Jacob and, and sends him off to find a wife from their clan. And, well, he wouldn't call it a happy ending, with, would you? But, but it's better than it could have been, I suppose. They still have two sons. One's not killed the other. But as Jacob walks off the stage, uh, there's one final sorry twist to this tale. Esau, he realises he's made a mistake in marrying these Hittite women. And so he, he tries to play catch up with his brother by taking another wife. And, and perhaps that should have warned him that his decisions was not going to be a great one. But rather than following his brother, Jacob to his uncle Laban. He instead goes to his uncle Ishmael. And Ishmael is, is the one relative in the family who, if you were with us this time last year when we were looking at Abraham's story, you will know that, that Ishmael has been declared outside of God's people. He's gone to the one uncle on the outside. And what did he do? He marries one of his daughters. Even at this late, late stage, Esau, he can't help but make another bad 
decisions. He, he's grasping at the coattails of God's blessing as he can see them going away. And yet he's still failing to live God's way. That's Esau all over in this section. He, he wants God's blessing, but he doesn't want to live God's way. And we've also seen Isaac. Isaac, he, 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 um, he's led by what he longs for rather than being led by the Lord. And Rebecca, well, she might want the right things, but she pursues it in the wrong way and for the wrong reasons. And as we see Jacob running off the stage, well, we, again, we see he's worried about being caught uh, rather than about his sin, rather than about his wrongdoing. They all learn the lesson of this passage. They all learn that sin doesn't pay. And they each learn that opposing God, it, it'll make you unhappy and that you won't win. Because what do we see? Well, Esau, he, he desperately wants a blessing, but he's left with a curse. Isaac, he longs for game, but he gets goat. He longs to bless Esau, but he blesses Isaac. Uh, Rebecca, she can't wait for Jacob to receive God's blessing. And yet, as we will see as we read on in Genesis, she'll never see Jacob again. And in fact, she will live the rest of her life in the company of Esau and his wives that so disgust her. And while Jacob, he did get the blessing, but he also got found out. And as we'll see in weeks to come, uh, he will meet his match in his uncle Laban. This family, they show us that sin doesn't pay, that opposing God makes us unhappy, that we, we can't win. And as they to sort of hold up a mirror to us, it is worth looking into that mirror and seeing what reflects on you. Uh, something you might want to use to do that is uh, at the bottom of our service sheet, probably with the runner order, it's our coffee time question. Uh, reflecting on this later might be helpful. It asks, uh, which character do you see the most of when you look in the mirror? Uh, are you persuaded that, that their sin and yours doesn't pay? And then rather than following in their mistakes, what would it look like to repent, to turn away from that sin, to turn back to God? Uh, that'd be a good thing to consider, to reflect on later. But as we come to the end of our, our time looking at this section, I don't want us to end thinking about ourselves. And rather, I, I want us to end with God and, and what this story teaches us about him. Although, did you notice, he was almost entirely absent from this account. He, he's mentioned in passing a few times, but that's about it. And yet at the end of this section, well, Jacob has his blessing, as God said would happen. Things are working out God's way. Because God is able to use sinful human actions to bring about his good purposes. He, he did that in the days of Genesis, and he's done it throughout history. And of course, the one occasion when he did this on the grandest of scales is particularly good news for those of us who find ourselves standing alongside Jacob and his family. And as we stand alongside them, we find ourselves opposed to God. I'm sure it's a story that many of us know. Jesus, the son of God, had done nothing wrong. And yet he was given over by his own people to be convicted by a kangaroo court before being killed as a common criminal. It was the most abhorrent, most sinful human action in all of history. And yet what happened? Well, God used it for his good purposes. Uh, Jesus' death at the hands of sinners was the very thing that God used to save those sinners. 
that death. It's how people like Jacob, like Esau, like Isaac, like Rebecca, people who don't deserve God's blessing can receive his most precious blessing, his forgiveness. You see, this messy account in our Bible, it's here to teach us that sin doesn't pay. It, it's here to encourage us to leave that sin that will make us so unhappy behind. But it also points forward to the place where we should leave it. It points forward to the foot of the cross and it invites us to leave our sin there, at the place where God worked through sinful human actions to bring about his good purposes of blessing those who trust in him, that they might be forgiven. And so in a moment, we're going to together take our sin to the cross. We're going to say a prayer of confession uh, together. But before we do that, let me just give you a moment, a moment of quiet to respond personally uh, to what we've heard. And would you join with me in the words uh, that are coming up on the screen? Together we pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who truly repent, as you have promised through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And grant us, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live in a disciplined, righteous and godly life to the praise of your holy name. Amen. Amen. As our service comes, Towards its end, we're going to sing one last time. And this last song, let me invite the musicians up. It marvels. It marvels at the cross. And that God might come in the person of his son to die for people like us, for people like Jacob and Rebecca and Isaac and Esau, who turn their back on him. Uh, let's stand uh, and sing together. <laughs>